So let's get started again. Um, our next speaker is Roy Kaufman from the Copyright Clearance Center, and he's um, uh, Managing Director of New Business Ventures. And I'm not even going to tell you what he's going to be talking about. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you all for coming back promptly after the break. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about sustainability, and I thought I would start with Stephen's slide here about sustainability because I think it points to uh, something that is really, really critical. So we are at a conference here largely of publishers, and the definition of sustainability, uh, this community definition from Chowdhury, uh, economic sustainability is all about reducing costs to the user. Uh, how, you know, can we reduce the APC costs? That's what economic sustainability means. Um, but I would think that there's another form of sustainability, certainly from a publisher perspective, where yes, it's always great to reduce costs, but, and I'll, I'll touch on this on my later slides, at the end of the day, sustainability is actually being able to publish new content year in, year out, and that's not always in, what, how, how shall we say, it's not always in sync with bringing down the prices. Um, so I'm going to give a talk about sort of some of the things that we've been seeing, just bear with me. So. Uh, many of you know CCC uh, and are familiar with what we're doing with our rights link for open access platform where we're now managing um, what I would call author payments, uh, sort of workflow author payments. Not just open access, in fact we have some rights link open access publishers who are using us not for APCs but other things. But essentially it's about trying to help publishers um, manage these sort of new business models that, that are coming out of it. And I'm starting, I'm um, giving a talk here, I don't know if you guys probably recognize where that is a photo of, but that is uh, Times Square, New York. Uh, I have actually an office, uh, pretty much more or less from, from, from that view. Uh, I don't have that view because that would cost a lot more money than I'm willing to spend on my office. But if I went downstairs, I could get a view similar to that. Uh, the other thing about working in Times Square is you don't actually want to go downstairs because Times Square has uh, a bunch of different things in it. Um, I'm going to list three things that you see a lot of in Times Square. There's a lot of coffee, a lot of foot traffic, a lot of places where you can buy coffee. There's a lot of tourists. It's why you can buy all this coffee. And there's a lot of people in Cookie Monster outfits. And so when you work in Times Square, just has nothing to do with my talk about open access, but you tend to get into your office and you stay there. Um, but right now I'm actually going to talk about coffee. So why am I going to talk about coffee in a talk about open access? And the answer is, for most publishers, publishing prior to open access was you know, what we would call a business to business model. Yes, there were personal rate subscriptions, although those were generally bought by businesses fraudulently. And then there were, of course, member rate subscriptions. So there were some uh, business to consumer businesses, but really most of the business practices around science publishing were, you know, you had a customer, the customer was a business, it was a library, be it a corporate or an academic library, that was intermediated by another business called a subscription agent. And then the publisher is really trying to serve these businesses. And the business practices, therefore, that developed around that were business to business business practices. So when you're looking at building a sustainable open access business model, though, I think you have to start looking at business to consumer practices. And so what I like to do is look at other business to consumer practices and say, well, how do other things operate? Because there's a whole lot of sort of places where I think traditionally the open access publishing done by publishers doesn't really align to a, a B2C model so well. Um, we're getting there, actually. Uh, it actually gets to the question I, I asked earlier about pricing and pricing variation. But uh, we're not there yet. So I'm just going to talk about a couple data points. So to me, basically, when you buy a cup of coffee at a retail outfit, 
you're basically paying for coffee. Okay, you could say it's dirty water, whatever, but I'm just going to call it coffee, cow's milk, and yes, there are other options, and sorry if you're a vegan, but I'm just going to say it's basically some sort of combination of coffee, cow's milk, and sugar. That's what most people are buying. And so if you go to Starbucks um, in, in Times Square, it's $4.45 for, uh, $4 for a large cappuccino. Um, by the way, the Starbucks, because there's Starbucks everywhere in Manhattan, the one half a block from my apartment, charges the same. But when you get to Jackson Heights, by the way, uh, this is sort of like Where's Waldo? This is the hardest one. Can you see me in the picture? Um, the other pictures are more obvious. Um, but you go to Jackson Heights, which is a, a different neighborhood, presumably with lower rent, and also a, a different clientele, fewer tourists, more people who live there. Um, the price is actually lower, even though it's the same cap, uh, Starbucks large cappuccino, same brand, same everything. We also have, see, I'm easier to spot in this one. It gets easier. I figured, you know, why tax people? Um, we also have across from my office Europa Cafe. Now, has anyone ever heard of Europa Cafe? Okay, it's not a big brand. I'm, I'm not even sure if it's a chain exactly. But interestingly, they charge even more than Starbucks. And so, you know, how do they do that if it's not really a brand uh, for the same thing? And then the last thing we have uh, is what we call the man in the can coffee. So this is actually my favorite coffee. You go to a guy who sets up, he gets uh, pulled out at noon and gets replaced by someone selling shawarma. But um, you can get this coffee for a buck and a quarter. It's more or less the same ingredients. I actually prefer the taste of this. So what am I getting at here? So there's a few different things. And, and this really gets into, um, this part of the talk is about APC pricing. So if you look at subscription publishing and you look at a, a publisher that has you know, hundreds of journals or 20 journals, and you look at, again, the rack rate for that subscription, the rack rate for the subscription for one journal and another journal, they're not going to be the same. All journals tend to have different prices and then a lot of price variation within that. So you have the personal rate, the member rate, the collection rate, you know, and how long have you been in a collection if you're in a library with a price cap. The rates really vary a lot. But initially, all prices for APCs um, were getting set sometimes at the discipline rate, sometimes at the publisher rate. Like, the, you know, for a publisher with 20 different disciplines, their basic APC in a hybrid would be $3,000. So how did we get there? That's not price optimization. That's convenience. I'm just going to name a price because we don't know where this business is going. But now they're sort of anchored into a price. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But when you start looking at B2C, you start realizing that there's a lot more nuance in pricing. So if the man in the can charged what Starbucks charged, he has no brand, no one would buy. But he's always got a line. So he's doing very well, charging a different thing without a price for a different thing without a brand. On the other hand, Starbucks has this very powerful brand, so they can charge $4.45. It's a lot more than man in a can. But ironically, Europa Cafe is the highest price, even though they don't really have a powerful brand. They don't have nature. So why are they five and a quarter? Um, and I've been trying to figure this out. One is you don't go there for the coffee. You go there because they have really good food and pastries. They also do a lot of delivery to businesses. Uh, if you're going to go for coffee, you're going to go to Starbucks, but if you're there anyway, you're going to pay, a, they'll charge a premium and you're not going to leave to save 60 cents at the Starbucks. Again, it's about sort of stickiness and why the customer is there. So what do we learn from this sort of B2C model? And I'm using coffee, but now I'm going to switch to t-shirts. So in Times Square, I can get a $5 t-shirt, it's going to shrink the moment it gets washed and it says Times Square on it and it's sold at a tourist store. Or I could go to a fancy designer store and probably spend $100 on a t-shirt. So a lot of times when we're looking at APC pricing, there, there's all this you know, sort of notion of this is the right price for an APC. Um, and there's a lot of reference pricing because I think almost all APCs were set based on what PLOS started charging 
because if you're an OA publisher, you might say, a fully gold road publisher, you're going to say, well, I'm going to charge a little bit less than PLOS or I'm going to charge the same as PLOS. Not a lot of people went into, I think, very detailed pricing and analytics. They just said, well, what's PLOS charging? They're my competition. And you really have to think, are they your competition? Are you competing with PLOS or are you competing with someone else? Likewise, I think on the sort of traditional hybrid journals, I, I think, I um, can't remember, I think Elsevier was pretty early to start doing pricing on hybrids and like all pricing in STM, sorry, I'm going to let out a secret, everyone just looks to see what Elsevier does and says, okay, well, how am I going to price around them? Again, if that is your competition, that's a perfectly fine thing to do. But I don't think the $5 t-shirt and the $100 t-shirt are competing with each other just because they're selling t-shirts any more than I would say, you know, is nature competing with Hindawi? Maybe, maybe not. These are different products, different services at different markets. And so when you're looking at your pricing, don't, you know, this sort of notion of reference pricing, if you're just looking at reference pricing without really thinking about who your competition is, then I think you're losing your ability to price appropriately. Um, now here's the other thing. Now we have a lot of great talk about brands and I think brands are really important and they're completely not important. So what does that mean? Again, we're talking market segmentation here. So, um, you know, Starbucks I don't think is competing with the man in the can uh, but if they tried, the man in the can would lose. Cannot charge as much as Starbucks, nor can Starbucks bring their price down to the man in the can. So, you know, Nature is a really, really powerful brand. Plus is a really, really powerful brand. Um, and if you're trying to compete with those brands, you're going to have a hard time because brands are, by very nature, designed to, you know, keep off competition. But if you sort of say, well, I'm not competing with that brand, so I'm going to compete on something else, and it could be on price. I know all I really talked about there is price, but you could be competing on service. You can be competing on lots of other things. So, you know, are you, you know, where you are, let's say, a large publisher who's doing a cascade model from the sort of, high, you know, high intensity peer review subscription journals cascading into a mega journal. That's what you're really offering. You're offering the, the sub-brands of, you know, of, the, of the high impact subscription journals and then you're offering the convenience. And so again, you know, can you compete with nature? It's very hard. Well, if you're science, you probably can because you've got that powerful brand. PLOS you know, is competing in a different way. But again, start thinking about how you're competing and, and whether the brands matter and whether they don't. But if you're in a non-branded environment, you know, one way to compete is in cost, which is the man in the can. The other way to compete is through services. You, you're offering other things that that first publisher doesn't have. So maybe PLOS or Nature don't have certain services that, you know, you know language polishing or whatever, um, you know, kudos. And I'm not, I don't know who does kudos or doesn't. Start thinking of other products you can offer so you're having a more complete suite because your author you know, some want that nature brand, some don't care. Some are just trying to get quick publication, some will rather wait. Um, some care about price, some don't. Some are part of a society and therefore care more about their community. You know, all of these things uh, differ and in a really robust market for open access, which is what we're developing into, um, you know, it's not just PLOS anymore, there's a lot of competition. Start thinking about different co competitive differentiators. Um, another thing I like to say is everyone loves a perceived bargain. Uh, so what, what is a bargain? So what, how much does it really cost Starbucks to make that cup of coffee? Uh, obviously the rent is more, but the cup of coffee is probably cheaper than the man in the can. Um, so if you are going to go to the man in the can because you're price sensitive, but get a coupon which makes Starbucks only 50 cents more, a lot of people are going to go for that. A lot of people won't. Some people just want the man in the can. Some people don't care about, you know, some people want to save that 50 cents. But I think there's a lot, um, a, a real lot of value in, in discounts and discount schemes in, in open access publishing. So, you know, you want your repeat customers in, you give them a discount, you give them a, a code. Uh, and not just, 
because it helps you get, you know, you know, all the, not just because it helps you get more business or it helps you get repeat customers and all of those things, but it also helps you price optimize because we really don't know what is the optimal price for a specific journal's APC within a specific discipline. So just because two journals are biomedical doesn't mean their authors have the same level of funding. It doesn't mean they have the same level of interest. If one biomedical journal is a sub-discipline of another, there might be different price points and you're never going to figure out what those price points are to optimize your, your, um, your APC business, and I'll talk to you what I mean by optimize in a second, without really experimenting with prices. So one of the things we think that manufacturers do is they use coupons both because people like coupons and B, it helps them price, um, you know, price optimize. Now, when I talk about price optimizing, the one thing I always like to point out is there might be a difference in price optimization between fully OA uh, mega journals and hybrids. So it may very well be that a publisher wants to keep their number of open access journals within a subscription journal at a certain level. So they might say, you know, some publishers, oh, I want to flip everything. I'm going to find out what the price is to get the most in. Others might say, you know what, I like the subscription model. I only want to have about 3 or 4% APC driven OA. How are you going to figure out you know, what's the optimal price to get that number? Price is one of your few mechanisms there because you don't want to give bad service. So price is pretty much your only lever. Um, and just talking about price a little bit, I, I will say, and I, I did a, um, a scholarly kitchen guest post on this, um, which was sort of, you know, how do you grow your APC, your open access business, sorry, not APC business. How do you grow your open access business at a time of peak APC pricing? So what do I mean by peak APC pricing? If you think of subscriptions, you know, you, you can argue as to what people are actually paying, but you know the rack rate has, goes up more or less every year by a certain percentage point. So that's the trend. How often do APCs actually get raised from publishers? I mean, think of you guys. If, if you have a, a, uh, an APC business, are you raising it every year? I don't think anyone does. Are you raising it every three years? Well, you know, PLOS did that and, you know, PLOS has a, as we know, relatively low price, um, you know, pretty good value for, for APCs. And even they, and, you know, they're loved by the open access community. I think that's all fair. And yet when they raise prices, there was all this heat and pressure. Um, as there are more entrants, the cost for publishers of, of publishing, they don't go down very much. You can get to some efficiency of scale, but at some point you're not going to, you know, your prices, your costs go up every year, but there's more and more competition, and so there's a lot of downward pressure on price. Yes, Nature came out, and they have a pretty, um, pretty high APC, you know, behind their brand, but you also have Pure J and Ubiquity and others who are really trying to push the prices down. So your lever to raise APC prices at gross scale, yeah, you don't have a lot of levers. I, I think it's a pretty difficult environment to do that. Um, other things that we should know as consumers, well, we like convenience. And I think all publishers who are doing, yeah, I think all publishers recognize this. You know, the, the author is now king in a way that, you know, we used to say in the subscription world but didn't fully mean. Now we know we need to be serving the author within a workflow. Things need to be convenient. Um, but you can charge more and make things better. Uh, you know, we all know that, you know, if you pay extra, you, you get, you know, you get to cut the line. So there are people who are experimenting with faster, um, you know, faster peer review. You know, if you pay a premium. Um, there's all these different things you can do uh, and charge more. Uh, and again, I think, and again, I'm going to get to this in a later slide, I don't think you're going to be able to raise APCs very much, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to cut costs and, and make more sustainable business models looking at the author as the customer. Um, so, again, so how are we going to grow businesses? Are we at peak OA? Uh, I actually don't think so. 
I think people could have argued about it. I think Horizon 2020, which Louise mentioned earlier, I, I, you know, particularly with the press, pressure from the, uh, the UK, Germany, and, and the Netherlands, uh, you know, uh, pro-gold approach, I think we're going to see even more growth in gold. I also think green will eventually start doing damage to the subscription model such that publishers, you know, a fully OA publisher doesn't mind green at all because it doesn't hurt their business. But if you're a subscription publisher, it does. So I do think there's going to be more, you know, just increased pressure on the subscription models. And if green starts getting to that point where it, you know, eats itself, which is, you know, the whole point of green is to sort of destroy the business model that supports it. Yes, I've said that. Um, uh, you know, we're going to see more, more motion. But peak APCs, this is going to be hard. I mean, which publisher, you know, really, really wants to raise their APCs even $200, even after 10 years, knowing that the community is going to start kicking and screaming? Um, so, you know, what do you do in this world where, you know, you're looking at, you know, B2C, um, you're looking at an inability to raise APCs. Um, so, a few things you can do. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is what all kinds of businesses do. One is you cut costs to the bone. Um, and that can mean efficiencies of scale. You outsource. You do, you do whatever you can do. But there's some point at which you can't cu cut anymore because prices, you know, you know yeah, you, you cut out all the fat, but then you're, you're done. And you still have to improve your services. And, and um, you know, I think that's really key. So you know, if you, you know, take all your costs out of your system, where's your money to reinvest in you know, post-publication peer review, all the really cool stuff that you know, PLOS is doing, you know, all, all of that stuff. Um, you can always publish more. Uh, again, yeah, that's the easy thing. That, that's sort of the cop out. Well, well what am I going to do? I'm just going to do more of it. You know? And that's great if you can. Um, you know, the good thing about OA is, at least in the, in the purely electronic mega journal, it's not bound by page budgets. You're not so worried about, you know, you know raising subscription prices. That doesn't happen. You, know, you publish more, you publish more, you publish more. Uh, again, with Horizon 2020, I think we're not at that peak. So I think there is opportunity to publish more, although everyone's doing it. Uh, and as we've seen from you know from those slides earlier today, you know it's you know it's hurting PLOS. Nature's growing, but you know lots and lots more publishers are, are jumping in the the OA bandwagon for a lot of great reasons. Um, but there will be more competition, so it's not that easy just to say I'm going to publish more, especially since you're not going to drop your editorial standards. Yes, peer review light is different editorial standard from sort of most traditional publishing in subscriptions. But it's still a pretty high editorial standard, and once you drop that, the game's over. So outside of you know sort of sham and you know uh, predatory journals, which I don't really think of as real businesses anyway, you can't go that can't go much further. Definitely, you can price optimize. I've talked about that a million times. I'm going to say it again. I think it's really interesting that we haven't price optimized. So again, if you look at subscription journals, everything's got a different price. Well, why does everything have a different price? Because the prices have presumably been price optimized. You launch a journal, you figure out what that journal is. I, I, I'm still amazed at the lack of price optimization within OA. Um, some people do it, like Hindawi does it at the title level, um, but a lot of people don't do it at the title level. I think, I think at a minimum you want to do it at the title level. And then you need to take it one step further and then start doing it at the sub-market level. So what do I mean? You know, if, you know, if there's a maximum APC price you're ever going to get out of India or China, you should start thinking about charging that to people in India or China. And you can do that through discount codes. You can do that through pricing. Obviously, when you make your prices transparent, your people in one country say, why are you charging them less than me? You start getting manipulation. So there are different ways to get at that. Um, but those are things you need to look at. And then the last thing, and this is um, you know, certainly something that we've been seeing um, you know, our 25 plus publishers do, it's really increasing your product offerings. So wait, let me go back. How do I go back? So you know, what do I mean by increased product offerings? So selling author reprints. Now a lot of people are saying, well, why do authors buy reprints? And the answer is they do. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if it's CC by authors or any authors who can print their own copies. People like those pretty reprints. Um, color and page charges are still a very big deal. Um, now, you can say there's no page charges with open access, but there certainly can be with hybrids. Uh, color charges, if you can sustain them. The one thing we're seeing a lot of interest in now, um, and again, so publishers are like coming to us, can we try this, can we try that? A couple things we're seeing, a lot of interest, not surprisingly, in connecting APCs with member dues. So if you, you know, a lot of publishers, society publishers, I'm just going to pick a number, they'll charge $3,000 for an APC, but $2,000 for an APC if you're a member, and membership costs $200. So why not link those and just make a $2,200 APC includes free membership, and then you can use your research budget, not your personal budget. Kind of interesting things you can do here. You're now growing, you're, you're, of course, you're minimizing to some degree the amount of money you're getting from APCs, but you're maximizing your membership, and that's you know, for most membership organizations, a lot more important. Um, the other thing that's really fascinating, particularly with high rejection factor, uh, high rejection journals, is we're going to see submission charges coming back in a big way. Because right now, you get, you know, you know let's say you're rejecting, let, let's pick, you know, really highly, highly uh, selective journals. You reject 95%, that money, that, that, that money that you've just gotten, that's gone. Whatever you spent on that, for those 95%, that's gone. If you're not cascading them to your own open access journal, they're just going to your competitor next, you know, the next tier, and it's just going to go down. You've lost all that money. Now, what are you going to charge in a submission fee? Well, it's not going to be the cost of even that initial peer review. But if you charge $100 and then multiply that across that 95%, and maybe that $100 acts as a barrier for a very small number of people who just don't want to waste the $100, and then you apply the credit against APC, so anyone who gets accepted, it's neutral, you can actually start recouping a lot of costs, bring down your cost of peer review, and all is well, except for one thing, which is, as we know, many highly selective journals have historically liked to brag about how much they reject. So you need to have a slightly different mindset. You need to recognize that, OK, I will have maybe slightly fewer articles to reject if I bring this in, but it will also bring my costs down. This is why editors-in-chief might not like this nearly as much as CFOs, but the CFOs really like this. So um, that's, that's another thing we're seeing. Other things you know, that we're talking with publishers about you know, is putting language polishing in very early in the flow where authors can pay, you know, they can say, well, I'm going to say, you know, we're going to require language polishing and you can do this yourself or you can use this language polisher who we use and then, you know, you basically pay the language publisher. It's easier for the author in the work, it's easier for the author in the workflow and the publisher can take a cut of that. Not forcing the authors to use them, but certainly making it easier and taking a small, small piece of that. Look at services like Get Kudos, which currently is um, more at the publisher level and isn't at the individual author level. But start thinking of what things that authors want. What do they want? They want recognition. They want speed. They want help. They want to be able to deposit the manuscript and, and stay within that workflow because they have research to do and, and publishing isn't what they really want to spend their time on. So there's a lot of different things you can do. And I'm just going to make one point, which is, even if you could raise APCs, we know that as the APCs go up, um, you know, certainly a lot of academic institutions who are also buying subscription journals say, okay, well, I want an offset. So, you know, I'm paying all this money, I, you know, you know, the, you know what's the so-called double dipping argument, all of that, all of those things don't really exist in a world of submission charges. They don't really exist on reprints. There is no uh, member dues. These are not things that I think are open to that sort of criticism of double dipping or the argument that there now needs to be some sort of offset against subscriptions. So it's just another way of looking at it, looking at businesses that are not going to be as controversial, um, that don't necessarily, you know, you make money here and you lose it there, just really additive businesses. And 
certainly, you know, at CCC, and you're talking, there's a bunch of us here, and we're sponsoring drinks tonight, you know, we're looking at all these different ways to sort of do that and to meet the goals. So I don't, I wasn't really timing myself, so I have no idea if that was too much or too little, but I'm just going to stop. <laughs>